So our last encounter is with the risen Christ. We couldn't end it without an encounter with Jesus Christ who is risen. And this is the Christ that's conquered and he's gained the victory over death. And in this encounter, we meet two men who are sad, they're disheartened, and they're walking away. They're walking away from Jerusalem where they left Jesus on the cross. And they're actually, you know, they find themselves uh, lost hope, that, that hope of redemption. They've lost the hope of victory over their enemies. And they've lost their leader. You know, we all find ourselves in a place where we just hope that something great is going to happen. We put our hopes in something. We look to that, and then it's dashed. And that's where these two disciples find themselves. Their, their hopes have been dashed, but it's not just the death of person that they were mourning. It was the death of a leader, the death of a community that they had together, the disciples. It was the death um, of a direction as well. You know, Jesus gave them a purpose, a direction. And so when he died, the disciples scattered. They were hopeless. They had no direction. And here's these two disciples walking away from Jerusalem, from the place of the cross. And they were walking away in sadness. You know, they were disheartened. And like I said, we can find ourselves in a place where our hope has died. You know, with each new circumstance, we hope that something's going to change, that something will be renewed, that... You know, generally things are going to get better and better. But in the end, we end up just sort of shaking our heads and walking away in sadness because sometimes it just seems hopeless and that's where they are. And they're, they're just saying, you know, where to now? Where do we go now? And that's where they were. They were sort of wandering and, and where do they go? So on this day that we find on the road to Emmaus, it's a Sunday. It's the day that Jesus resurrected. He was risen on that day, and it's the evening. The Passover had ended. It, the disciples had gone to Jerusalem for the Passover, and now they were most likely going home. And it was to their place in Emmaus. And so we meet these two disciples. It's in verse 13. And it says, On that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So we meet these two disciples. And what do we know of them? Well, one of them is called Cleopas. And the other one has no name. We don't know his name at all. They're not famous disciples. You know, they're not people we meet over and over again. Cleopas may have been mentioned in a couple of the scriptures, but we don't really know. They're nameless, kind of, or they're not famous at all. But what they are is their followers. And that's the most important thing. They may not be famous, but they were followers. And Jesus takes an interest in followers, not fame. You know, you don't have to have the biggest name to gain the interest of Jesus. You just have to follow him faithfully. And what were they doing? I love what they were doing because, you know what, I feel like this could be me. This could be me and my friend, me and my mom, me and my husband. It, you know, I see myself in these two. They were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So here they are. They're just chatting about what has gone off. But it's not just chatting. It's not just a chit-chat. They're saddened. They're sort of chewing it over. They're discussing the circumstances of what had happened, what's gone on. They're describing what they saw, talking about what they felt, talking about maybe their, you know, their hopes being dashed. They're just going over the situation. And don't we find ourselves there so many times? going over the current situations, the things that happened yesterday, that happened last week, things that are happening around the world, the wars, the leaders resigning, leaders escaping, you know, and things in our own lives, our friends, our families, situations that are going off. We, we find ourselves just talking about what happened, going over, and these current situations consumed their minds, so much so they didn't recognize Jesus when he came to walk with them. Now, it says that their eyes actually were kept from recognizing him in verse 16. So it seems like it's an involuntary thing for them to do, but it could be that they're just so focused on their despair and what's happened that they didn't see Jesus. They weren't in that position to actually see that that's where he was. He was right next to them through it all. All they could think about and see was the things that had consumed them over in the last few days. And so there they had lost, they'd lost their direction and they'd lost their vision 
too. They, they actually couldn't see. You know, their lack of direction in their minds caused them not to see Jesus physically as well. And so we see Jesus walking with them. And I love this. This is the risen Christ, right? Even if we're going in the wrong direction, Jesus comes alongside and he walks with them. He doesn't forget them just because they're wandering away. He's not like, oh, they're leaving. I better focus on these. He actually takes his time to come alongside. He was, before he was crucified, he was that leader teaching up front. He was giving messages. He was teaching. He had authority. He was healing. He did miracles, you know, made the blind see. He walked on water. He calmed the seas. He showed his power. He was a real leader to look up to. But now there's risen Christ. We see he's not leading from the front. He's now coming alongside. And he's now walking. This risen Christ is walking alongside these two disciples. And as we read the text, we'll find that he listens to them. He questions them. And he notices the state that they're in. You know, Jesus could have come alongside and said, Hey, it's me. I'm Jesus. I'm risen. Don't be sad. Turn around. Go back to Jerusalem. There's something waiting for you. He could have done that. But he chose not to. He didn't do it. He chose to walk with them in their sadness in their despair, and he chose to listen to their hearts, question them, talk to them. And as we'll see, he actually then teaches them as well. So as we get into the text, we're going to see there are times when we lose our vision, isn't there? When we lose hope, something happens, we lose our hope, we lose sight of what we're doing. And sometimes we need to just come back around and focus on Jesus. So we're going to look at six things to do, six steps to try to refocus our minds. Now, it would be great if Jesus could just come alongside us, just tell us and give us some pointers and, you know, expound the scriptures to us, next to us, break the bread, and we'd be like, hey, you know, now we know what to do. But we don't have that. We do have the Holy Spirit. But we can look at this and we can look at this encounter and just maybe take a few things from it as, okay, how can we revive our vision? How can we get back to focus on the Lord? And so that's what we're going to look at in this experience. So as we look at it, it says in verse 16 that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And in 17, he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? So he's asking them, okay, what, what are you talking about? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? He's like, You've been living in a cave? Are you the only one that doesn't know? Where have you been? You know, you, you didn't know all of this? And it's ironic, isn't it? You know, Jesus asked them, So what are you talking about? What you don't know? Of course he knew. He was there. Jesus lived it, experienced it. But now Jesus isn't asking because he didn't know. Obviously, he did know. But Jesus is asking for them to share their hearts with him. And that's the first thing. The first thing that we need to ask ourselves is what happened? What happened? Not just what happened, but what happened to cause the sadness? And that's kind of what Jesus is getting at. What happened? What happened that you lost your vision? What was it? So sometimes we just need to sit and it's funny because they were talking about what happened, why they lost their sadness. But what Jesus wants us to do is to bring it to him. Not just talk about it with our friends, our family, and each other, but to bring it to him. Jesus wants you to tell him, okay, this is what's happened. Somebody died. I lost my job. A hope was dashed. And now there's sadness. And now I'm losing my vision of following Christ, that hope, that joy, this is what happened. And we bring it to the Lord. Jesus wants to give us that opportunity to express ourselves, to articulate, to pinpoint that sadness. Let me pinpoint it so that I can deal with it and not just neglect it, but I'm going to pinpoint it and deal with it. And Jesus wants to do that. He doesn't want us to say, okay, this is why you're sad, da, da, da. But he wants us to see it. He wants us to evaluate things. And that's why he questions them, not because he doesn't know. We all know he does know, but he wants us to know. He wants us to pinpoint that and give it to him and talk to him about it. It's great to chat about things, but you know what? Jesus is the best counselor. He's the best one to bring all of our problems to. And in their response, we learn a couple of things from it. It's very interesting. The first thing that we learn from them is our second point, but we'll just read it. 
So they say, you know, are you the only visitor that doesn't know? And Jesus says, okay, what thing? So he gets them to talk about it. And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. So they go on to describe Jesus of Nazareth. And this is the second point, if we want to try to refocus our minds on Christ, is first of all, or secondly, what do we know about Jesus? What is it that we know? And these men, this, they described him. They knew his name, Jesus of Nazareth. They knew where he was from. They knew that he was a, a prophet. He was a prophet. He'd come from God. He spoke the words of God. And they said he is mighty in deed and word before God and people. And that's important. So his works were mighty. The things he did, the healings, the miracles, but the things he said as well, his words. And this is what they knew about him. But also... He was mighty before God and all the people. Jesus wasn't just a people pleaser. He was also mighty before God. You know, he had integrity as well. It wasn't just about drawing the crowds and pleasing them. It was about pleasing God too. And this is who Jesus was. So these disciples, they started talking about their Jesus, who they knew who he was. And they started at that point. Who is he? But also what hopes did you have? And if you notice, they said that they hoped that he would redeem Israel, save them from the Romans, and he would set them free. That was their hopes. And, you know, our hopes are often linked to his character as well. So what do we know about Jesus and where are our hopes? What do we hope from him? What do we put our hopes in? You know, they're, they're too linked to the person of who he is and what are our hopes. And that's where we start. We start at that, start of what we know of him, He's a prophet, a redeemer, he's faithful, he's kind, he's gentle and lowly. And as we get our minds back to Christ, this is what we know about him. And it's interesting, isn't it, that their hopes had not been fulfilled. You know, they felt like their hopes had not been fulfilled, and yet that he was a prophet, he was the redeemer, they just hadn't seen evidence of it yet. So they thought their hopes had been dashed and had been completely crushed. And they were crushed as well. Their hearts were broken, weren't they? To see their leader, their friend, who they thought was their savior, die on a cross in an agonizing way. Their hearts were broken. But it was in that crushing that actually was their salvation. Their sins were forgiven, weren't they? When he died, with their hearts being broken, that was their salvation. And so we see sometimes our most crushing moments can actually be our redemptive moments as well the brokenness that we feel. Sometimes that's the redeeming parts of us when we bring it to the Lord and we find his healing. That's the redemption. And so these disciples, although they'd lost hope, well, actually their hope was completely fulfilled in that which they thought they'd lost hope in. You know, it's, it's all rather ironic, but it's, it's a beautiful picture as well. Just when we think we've lost hope, well, actually we haven't. That point, that's our redemption. That's when the hope is fulfilled. They just hadn't seen it yet. The second thing we learn, which isn't a point of, you know, these six steps at all, but it's just something really interesting. As we go on, they said, you know, we'd hope that he'd done these things. But they say, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying they'd seen a vision of angels and said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. So interestingly enough, they knew he was risen. They'd heard rumors of it. They knew, you know, and that just, you, you can see Jesus' response after that as he, he, as he responds to them. But you see that although their hopes had been dashed, they actually did know. They had been told, the angels had told the women, the women had told them. But as Jesus said, he says in verse 25, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. He calls them foolish and slow of heart to believe. Now, it seems pretty blunt. And, you know, Jesus kind of was pretty blunt. And nowadays, we don't really speak to sad people like that. Oh, you're foolish. You know, it's not advised to say to a sad person, but Jesus does. Jesus says it and he says, you're slow of heart to believe. And they were. They were. Their hearts were slow to believe the evidence that was before him. And that's where the sadness came in. 
because they couldn't quite believe Jesus had been with them. He had told them this was going to happen. It had happened. And now that he was risen again, they still didn't quite understand. It was their hearts. It was a heart issue. It wasn't even a knowledge issue. It was a heart issue. And that's where Jesus got to. He's like, you're slow of heart. This is causing part of the sadness is your heart not believing. And so as he speaks to that, he then goes, doesn't he? And he begins with Moses and all the prophets. And he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he gave them a Bible study. So after saying, you know what? Your hearts aren't believing. He then teaches them how to believe. He then teaches them again what to believe. And he ties it all together. So he takes what they do already know about him being a mighty prophet and, you know, mighty in word and deed. And then he elaborates on it. And he goes from Moses all the way, and he shows them how this was supposed to happen. This is exactly what is happening. And that's point number three. And that's what we have to do. We need to study the scriptures continually. We can't just rely on what we know. It's great to sit there, you know, in our moments to go, okay, Jesus is faithful. He is true. It's good to remind ourselves, but then we also need to study continually as well and go back to the Word of God because there's nothing more powerful than actually reading the Word of God verse by verse and studying what it is, like what Jesus did. He's like, okay, you know this much. Now let me help you know even more. And there's always more that we can learn. We can't just rely, oh, yeah, I've read it once before. I'm good to go now. We have to keep going back. And they, you know, when they said later on, I'm sure most of you know the passage, that their hearts burned within them when he spoke about the scriptures. And that's how powerful the scriptures are. When we speak them, they're powerful. God's word is powerful. It's a two-edged sword. It doesn't come back void. You know, there's so many scriptures there that the power of God's word, we need to study it. We need to immerse ourselves into it. If we want to get our vision back, if we want to see Jesus, we've got to get back into the scriptures and go through it. And we see Christ in the Old Testament. And I love the thought, you know, I don't know whether you've seen those studies, seeing Christ in the Old Testament. There's several of them around. I've always wanted to do one, but Jesus gave these two disciples their very own study. <laughs> this is me in the Old Testament. I'm like, wow, wouldn't you just love to have been there and actually listen to that study that he gave them? They were two very special disciples that got that. And the more they learned, the more comfort that they can receive as their hearts burned. And they began to receive that comfort, didn't they? Because it says, as they drew near to the village to which they were going, he acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So they were enjoying his company. There was something about him. They wanted him to stay. They wanted him to come. The day's almost done. You can come in and you can stay with us. And so it says, verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while we were on the road as he opened the scriptures? And that's the point number four to commune with Jesus, to invite him to the table, to sit at that table with him and to break that bread. Now, there's something special in the Jewish culture about sharing a meal and sharing that bread. Once you break the bread, part of it goes to you, part of it goes to me. We become, it's the fellowship. We sort of, we become one. It's this deeper fellowship. And so they broke the bread. Now, these disciples weren't at the Last Supper. So it's, it wasn't just a, oh, we remember this from the Last Supper. That's not what it is. And they weren't actually like taking communion as such. This was just a bite to eat, you know, which is what they would have done. Let's just have some bread. They're having a bite to eat with this you know, stranger that they brought in with them. And it was as he's breaking that bread, obviously he had some sort of authority about him. There was something there. We, we don't know. It does say that it was in the breaking of bread that they recognized him. So there was something special about Jesus breaking the bread and give it to him. whether it's the act of sharing the bread with him. He didn't eat it, but they were going to share the bread with him that opened their eyes. Or somebody said it could be that as he broke the bread that they saw his nail-pierced hands. It could be that. That's a nice thought 
It doesn't say that that's the reason, but I'm sure at some point they would have seen his hands and they would have seen that evidence and gone, wait, that's Jesus. And they did. Their eyes were opened at that time of communion, partaking with him. And that's the thing with Jesus. You know, 1 Peter 4.13 says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. That we partake with his sufferings. And that's part of communion with Christ, isn't it? Partaking with his sufferings. Knowing that we will suffer. We will be broken as well in the same ways that he is. Not crucified on a cross, but we will be broken too. We suffer and we partake in that, but we partake in his glory. And if we don't partake in his sufferings, we will never fully partake in his glory and have that joy, the exceeding joy. So we partake in his teachings, in his joy, in his peace, and in his sufferings too. All of the above. So these disciples, they walked with him, they listened to him, and then they sat at the table with him and at the breaking and the blessing when he blessed it. And maybe they recognized the blessing as well. They recognized him, the blessing and the breaking. And so he vanishes. He just disappears, like poof, and there he's gone. And these two disciples are left to go, oh, that was him. That was him. I knew, it. I knew it too, you know? I mean, you could just see them like, oh, that was him. I knew, I knew. Oh, our hearts burned. They burned. And what did they do? It says they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11. So point number five, they returned to the cross. They also acted upon what they knew to do. And what they had to do, their action, they knew they needed to return. And so they took action there. They didn't just sit there and go, oh, you know what, it is late. You know, I'm ready for bed. Let's just sleep on this experience and we'll go in the morning, you know, when we're refreshed. Maybe next week. When we get around to it, I've got a busy schedule. They didn't do that. That very hour, you know, they probably finished off the bread or talked about it a little bit. They went within the hour. They returned the seven miles. They've just walked seven miles. They turned right back around and they went those seven miles. They went right back. It kind of reminds me, you know, of Ruth and Naomi. You know, that Andy talked about that, you know, that Ruth and Elimelech had gone from the famine, hadn't they? They tried to escape it but they only suffered. And it wasn't until Naomi returned back to Israel, back to Bethlehem, did she find that rest. And it's in that returning to the cross, returning to that place that they found the rest and that these two disciples, they're going to return. They're going to return back to that place. They didn't just sit there. And you know what the great thing is, what I love? By returning, and, you know, the scriptures continue, although we're supposed to end it at 35. We're going to look a little bit more at 36 as well, because it actually says that as they were talking, Jesus himself stood among them. So by returning back, they saw Jesus again. They didn't miss out. They saw him again. And they went back, and it says, you know, that they went, they found the 11, so they went purposely back. Let's find the disciples. We've got to get back to these disciples they found them, and those who were gathered together, they got the 11, everybody else saying, and you know, the 11 were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how they had known him in the breaking of bread. So as they got there, you know, you have this scene of the disciples going, hey, we've seen Jesus. Simon saw him, and these two disciples going, yeah, yeah, I know, Cleopas and I, we saw him too. We were on the road, and we were walking down there, and, and we saw it. And they, you, know, you can just see this excitement of these disciples saying, we saw him too, and he broke the bread. And then we knew it was him. We didn't know it was him. There he is talking all about, we should have known it was him. We should have seen what Cleopas, yeah, we should have. What were we thinking? I don't know. I just don't know. We were too consumed, weren't we? You know, you see this joy coming from, and then as they're discussing, and then Jesus appears, doesn't he? You know, he just, there he is. He's in the midst, and he says, peace to you. And so these disciples, by turning back around, they saw Jesus again. And they got more instruction from Jesus as well. If we look at what he says, you know, he says, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart? They're all still struggling to believe. And it's a hard thing to believe. You know, it, it really is. But they're still struggling. So he says, see my hands 
and my feet, it's me, you can touch me. He says, a spirit does not have flesh. He eats, they give him something to eat, and he proves that he is in the flesh, it's him. And he also, he teaches them again, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. They got another Bible study. They were blessed again with more words, more teaching from Jesus. And he said, it's written that Christ should suffer and that he should rise again. But he also says in verse 49, and behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And this is the promise of the Holy Spirit because these disciples turned around. They didn't stay in Emmaus. They turned right back around. They saw Jesus and they received the promise that the Holy Spirit was going to come and give them power. And it's a reflection of, you know, how Jesus came alongside and walked with them. Well, Jesus was going to go, but he's not going to leave them. He's going to say, the Holy Spirit will walk with you. The Holy Spirit will replace what Jesus did with these disciples by walking alongside the Holy Spirit. The power that the Lord wants to give us is through the Spirit to walk alongside, teach us, bring to remembrance all the things that we need. We have the Spirit, and these two disciples partook of that promise as well because they returned, because they turned around. And the last point is just the simple point of proclaiming Christ because that's what they did when they returned to Jerusalem. They told of their experience. They said, hey, there's Jesus. We saw him. We heard him. This is what he said. This is how we looked. We, we saw him when he broke the bread. They proclaimed Christ. They, they had that witness, the testimony of what Christ has done for us. Our personal testimony is powerful. And that's what the Lord wants us to share, these things that because Christ died and rose again, I can rise from my sadness. I can rise from my hopelessness, from that despair I find myself in, from the pit from the darkness, I can do that because Christ has risen again. And we're going to play a song at the end of this, um, not just yet, but the end. And one of the lines to the song is that there's still good news to share. And it's true. There is still good news despite all the hopelessness we see around us. And maybe that we feel inside us. There is still good news to share, to share that good news. So that's, that's the, the six points that we can try to get ourselves back when we find ourselves wandering. But in conclusion, just to round it off, these disciples had allowed their sadness to lead them away from the cross, to lead them away from the presence of Jesus and from the promises of Jesus as well. But God pursued them. He didn't let them go. He pursued, he came alongside, Jesus followed. He walked with them so that he can commune with them teach them and encourage them and so that they could revive their hearts and renew their vision and in obedience they turned around and they went back back to the place of the cross my favorite part about this passage is in verse 26 and they say that the day is far spent 29 sorry they say stay with us for it's toward evening and the day is now far spent the day is done. They've spent everything. It's empty. It's exhausted. And it's, you know, you can kind of feel it. We're just done. We've given all that we can. Everything in this day, it's coming to an end. It's spent. You know, it's kind of like an empty bank account and, and all empty. It's all done. There's nothing left. There's nothing left to do. It's all done. And yet, that very hour after encountering Jesus, they had renewed energy to go back. You know, anybody looking on would go, wait, I thought the day was done. Wait, wait, oh, you're going back now? Apparently there's still time in that day to go back. There's always time because nothing is spent until God calls time. He's the one. It's never spent completely. He can renew it and revive it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these two disciples. Lord, we can see ourselves in them so often. Lord, just the sadness, the despair, when we think all hope has gone, where we think that 
the death of, of something has just caused the death of everything. But Lord, we know that that was just the beginning of our new life, that your death was there to conquer death so that we can live. And Lord, we know that it is not hopeless, that you can revive our hope, you can renew our vision. Lord, that you could give us energy to continue in the calling that you have given us. Lord, I pray if we feel empty, if we feel all spent, that there's no energy, no money, no vision, Lord, I pray that we would just bow our hearts towards you, Lord, and ask you to speak, to fill our hearts and our minds with you, that you would revive us. Give us that energy to continue, Lord. In your name.